comfortable wherever you are, in a restful, upright position. Allow your breath to be slow and comfortable, easy, making space. Notice for yourself if you are hanging on to your posture in some way. Find some way that you might be gripping something, because we usually are in some way. And then if you can, realign yourself and then release through that aligned structure. The more you soften, the more the tissues open, the joints expand. And the body feels more and more like that tensegrity toy that I showed yesterday, where it's a bunch of solid rods and only things pulling tight, elastic things pulling. And yet it holds itself apart. Nothing touches anything else, and it has this resilient structure. And that is one of the ways that we are fashioned. And the only way that we can create that is through alignment and then softening long so that all the joints open. But it makes the appropriate amount of space in our body. And just that ambient pull, the natural tension of the, the muscular tissue, the tendons, the ligaments, everything pulled tight, the whole body gets to be open and at the same time, stable, spacious, and yet comfortably firm in our position. And that only happens through relaxation. Just a few more minutes. Gently allowing the body to open. With every exhalation, softening further. With every inhalation, letting go of whatever it was that the mind was about to reach toward. Just stay here for a moment. You can always wander off and follow those thoughts later. Welcome, Dell. Nice to have you. Just settling into opening. I was just comparing our soft, open posture to that tensegrity toy that I was demonstrating yesterday. Letting everything go. The more you can soften open, the more stable and full and easy your posture becomes. We have people come to the long retreats that we do, and 
I'll hear from some of the newer students, oh, I'm nervous about sitting, or, or they skip the meditation periods because it's too uncomfortable to sit. And when I say something like, well, why don't you just sit in the chair or stand or <laughs> lie down? They look at me like it's impossible. Well, isn't meditation the seated posture? No. <laughs> the reason we sit like this, it does have some qualities of, if you're sitting correctly, of like allowing the chi to sink and consolidate into the center. Everything makes these circles toward the middle. But the main reason for it is that it's easy to become stable and comfortable and just forget for a little while about the posture. That's the reason for the posture. And so if if the posture itself is interrupting the practice, then we find a different posture. And so for you, sitting in a comfortable chair may be the best way to let your mind focus and your body open. And so at some point, if you can sit like this, for instance, then your chi more easily flows into the center. But it only works if you can relax into this posture. And that fluid open model, like with the breath, or the tensegrity toy model that I gave through the opening of the joints and the lengthening of the tissues into proper posture, all of these various qualities, they only come through letting go. And they make us very stable. And it's easy just to relax into the posture. I can fall asleep like this. I'm just being held up by the nature of the posture itself. And so you want to look for that. If you find yourself holding a position, then let it go as quickly as you can. And if you can't, then maybe sit a little bit higher, sit in a more comfortable chair, find some way to align yourself that is a little bit easier. And then you can ease yourself into a more stable seated posture. But the point is, not the, this posture. <laughs> so don't get them mixed up. Hmm. And I will take my headphones off in a moment and do the series for the head. And as I do in Every class for those people who are lurking in the background that are just beginning and are confused about what we are doing, please check down below the video in the comment section for links to videos that are introductions and explanations of what this set is about. Otherwise, you may find it confusing and off-putting instead of calming <laughs> and relaxing. Ah, this is... Oh. <laughs> It seems impossible to sit, though, because the calves and shins are gripping and they don't know how to let go. Yeah, that can be difficult. Do you mean sit like this or do you mean sit in a chair? Because I recommend the chair or one of your stools because that takes some of the pressure off of your hips and lower back until you can soften further. Uh, Master Jirsung actually tells everybody when they first come to these retreats, to start into chair because it's more comfortable and it's easier to actually learn the practice. But then they all see him sit on the floor and so everybody sits on the floor, it happens every time. And I have to go around to individuals and say, hey, just so you know, you can sit in a more comfortable way, but people say, no, I, I wanna sit like this. And like, you see them in pain and their legs are falling asleep and they're missing the point. <laughs> in the saddle, yeah. Yeah, and it's okay to have that gripping in your legs. You do, of course, want to become soft if you can. But that's one good reason to sit in the saddle or in a chair or something a little bit higher because then it supports you and you don't have to worry too much about sitting in a, a relaxed way that allows your circulation to continue. Because I can sit like this and my legs don't fall asleep because I'm sitting this way, not folding in. And that seems like a small distinction from there, but... My hips are open, my knees are soft, nothing is kinked. Everything is, a, is a, an open hose, and that is a very subtle difference. And if I was just to fold my legs and kink everything, then things start to fall asleep. And I remember I used to sit in the Zen position for hours, and I would pray <laughs> that my legs would fall asleep quickly because it was so uncomfortable. Now I recognize that as a very unhealthy way to approach it. And instead, you sit in such a way that all of this just becomes comfortable and easy. 
That's the point. And if you are pushing yourself through one of your postures, then you're practicing tension instead of this quiet relaxation. <laughs> Thank you for appreciating the silliness of my outfit. It wasn't even supposed to be silly today. <laughs> Yeah, you want your, your belly to relax as you breathe and soften. No pressure anywhere on your body.
I should mention, by the way, that during this one where we are allowing this part of our index finger to move over our eyebrows from the inside to the outside, you do also want to have pressure not just flat against the eyebrow ridge, but also just a little above it. And for me, because my forehead is flat, <laughs> just because of the way I'm built, I can hit both this line and that line just above it with the same part of my finger. But some people have a thicker eyebrow ridge, and so their eyebrows come further out, and the line just above their eyebrows is set back. And so you may actually want to purposefully work the line just above the eyebrows separately than on the eyebrows themselves, depending on the shape of your body. Just thought I'd mention it, because there's some wonderful points here in the eyebrow line, but also just above it. And if you run your fingers just above it, there's actually some, we call them foramen, they're, just, they're actually holes in your skull where the nerves come out and the fascial sheath thickens around those areas. And so softening along that line as well can be very helpful. And so when I do it, I'm hitting both, one with the lower part of my finger, one with the upper part of my finger. But depending on your body, you may want to adjust how your hands move. So use your best judgment.
Have a good day, Dill. Nice to have you here. And check the message for later and I'll answer your question. Make sure that you take the time to settle in between each. Let me check on Mel real quick. Supporting my mail always comes first. Ah, softening open. Yeah, it's interesting, one of the things that had gotten mentioned yesterday in the class was that Dell knew somebody who, during their spiritual practice, was very aloof and distant. I um, can't remember the term he used, like holding back his feelings in his relationship. And I've heard people talk about relationships in that way, that they, in order for spiritual advancement, they, they don't feel things. And, uh, and in my opinion, that is the exact opposite direction. <laughs> that you want to be as vulnerable and as open and as fully yourself as you possibly can be in your relationship. And at the same time, that also means being grounded and very stable and free. And so both aspects are that you, you can't lose yourself in the relationship because you are settled in your nature. You can't get lost or obsessed or freaked out because you are anchored. Your emotions are settled. And at the same time, part of being settled and healthy and healed is that aspect of vulnerability and willingness just to be yourself and to express what that looks like and to be connected and loving and caring and gentle. I think those qualities are integral toward the spiritual practice. And so <laughs> I hope it shows in my relationship with Mel. So today is a quick review Think about what channel this is. Shout it at the screen if you want. Think about what channel this is. Shout it at the screen. Think about what channel this is. Shout it at the screen. <laughs> now, this one. The fourth finger, the, the ring finger in the States. I don't know if it's the ring finger in other places. <clears throat> this one is a very useful channel as well. This is related to the, the san jiao, the, the triple warmer, triple burner, depending on how you translate it. And this is the system that recently Western medicine, Western anatomy was very excited to discover. Oh my gosh, a whole new system. No one's ever found it before. <laughs> and they're calling it the interstitium, but that doesn't seem like a name that's likely to stick. But for now, that's what it is. And it relates to the fashion. It relates to a lot of these systems that we're working with right now. So this very useful channel to know in relationship to the form that we're doing, but also just a useful channel to learn in general. And it is associated with this fourth finger. Look at it, appreciate it. <laughs> and so this channel runs up the outside of the arm to the outside back of the shoulder here. 
So if you were to circle the shoulder, where your fingers dip in as they sink to the back of the shoulder, this is toward that triple warmer section, Sanjiao. I'll just call it Sanjiao because I don't like the translations. Easing open the whole arm, especially this line toward the back. If you're not sure where it is, it's, it's likely to be where your fingers most easily sink in as your hand circles around. Softening all the way around, of course. And then let's work on this point here. So if this is the large intestine point we worked on before, what if you were back here? Above the elbow to the outside, you warmed that area. Remember that before I mentioned that for many people, this is cold and stiff. So if you warmed it with a little bit of friction, perhaps, that loving touch, and just enough pressure to help relieve the, the fascial system there. See what that feels like. Ah. From this back of the shoulder, down the arm, transitioning toward the top center of the arm, moving toward that ring finger. First, let's do the lungs here, easing open this point. Soft and gentle, being kind to yourself. Yeah, today it feels better for me to uh, kind of enjoying this feeling of the base of my thumb in this point. So find what for you feels the most soothing today. I really want to model this listening process, this willingness to let your form change based on what your body is asking for. Yeah, that feels really nice today. Easing and spreading gives me in my body, the way it's recognizing this softening is a kind of warmth spreading through the tissues. And it's not working quite the same way as it was yesterday when I was pushing this way. So I adjust. I listen. <laughs> I do it in my relationship with Mel. I do it in my relationship with my own body. That's part of this openness, this willingness to listen. This kindness and generosity of spirit. Be gentle, be present. It's all the same energy, the same expression. Learn it here, and you can express it in any part of your life. So I'll do the pericardium six point that we worked on yesterday, emphasizing that spot for a moment. Circling comfortably in both directions. Uh, this is less comfortable today, so I'll just use my fingers. Letting my awareness soak into that point. I spent the morning doing practice, playing the guqin, um, teaching a little bit, and mostly doing woodwork, <laughs> putting more of that floor in, which is why I can't use that room over there, because it's a construction zone at the moment. But getting more of the flooring in, the oak flooring is beautiful. And I can feel from the kind of construction I was doing that this area was starting to grow a little bit tight. So it's nice to release it. And then importantly for today is a wonderful point on the back of the wrist. We were working on it before, just, what is that? Two and a half centimeters or something up above the fold of the wrist. If you come up, depending on how your wrist is built, there's usually a little space there that your finger falls into. And that's the one we want to soften open. Easy and gentle, kind. If you are able to listen to your tissues in this way, what is it saying? What's being communicated to you? What are you noticing as you connect? Just 
right and that was a point and then that hard small intestine line just in through here gently circling easing it open I'm just holding it so you can see it more easily Base of the thumb, mostly emphasizing warming and moving through this point. But you might notice a, a thickening of the tissues here. The fascial that wraps the wrist as it's becoming injured grows thicker or tears or folds up here. <laughs> Make it so it's easier to see. Emphasizing, of course, this ring finger here. Softening through. <laughs> ah, and you can ask yourself, and feel free to post if you have a good idea, how are you relating the ring finger to this San Jiao channel, this triple warmer channel? to the, the fascial and the interconnecting system around it. Are you creating an image for it? For me, when I used mine, I used a ring because this finger reminds me of a ring because of our culture here. But you can use anything that you want with this finger. <laughs> it relates to sheep and goats of all things in Chinese cosmology. <laughs> Softening through, let me grab the key. <laughs> Up until moments before starting this, I was over there cutting planks of wood. I'm confused, Chris. Text lisp. <laughs> Wing of fire. Oh, the ring of fire. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it took me a second. <laughs> That's actually a really good image. And we'll review it regularly through the end of class. And so it should be easy to keep these. I just feel like knowing some of this information is useful in general everyday life. And this way I'll be able to start including more specific information about points and methods as well as we go. So there's a miniature traditional Chinese lesson going on during this 100 days. I am so impressed with you people who have been following through this long, both live with me now, but also people who might be following through this in the future. I just think it's wonderful that people can take the time to transform their bodies and their minds. Remember that this point back here, just past that little shoulder bone over here, that's part of this triple warmer channel. 
Also, the point that we were massaging up by the ear earlier, that's also a triple warmer point. So it goes all the way up. Oh, feels nice. Back of the elbow. Warm this whole area. There's a thickening of the the sheath, they call it an aponeurosis. It's the, the shape of the fascial and tendon and ligament structure here. It's all the same kind of collagen structure. And we want to warm it and fill it up. Ah. Softening open. Large intestine points on top of the arm. Comfortable and open. And again, use whatever part of your hand or wrist or your teeth, <laughs> whatever it is that works for you to soften it open today. I like your Ring of Fire image, Chris. That's cool. Uh, I used uh, the Eye of Sauron, that circle eye thing with on fire, so it's kind of close. <laughs> Softening open the Lung 5 point on the inside of the arm. <sighs> Easy and gentle. Pericardium 6. Maybe some of you are able to remember some of the more popular uses for this point. Gentle and comfortable opening. A lot of uses for this point, but some are more in the popular consciousness. And then, especially emphasizing for today, this outer gate point, Y Guan. Yeah, it's funny, this doesn't feel as good on this point today. Maybe I'll try this. Uh, not so much, still the fingers. <laughs> it's fun to listen. And once you have some positive confirmations of these areas of softening, again, like for me, the sense of warmth and comfort spreading from the point, I feel it spreading all the way through my body, up and down my arm, because that's the nature of the fascia. The fascia connects, it communicates. So these two points, even though they seem far apart, are connected very directly by this ring of fascia that's here, this ring of fire. And then softening that heart, small intestine line, easing it open. Warming and releasing the base of the, base of the thumb.
And if you can find that confirmation of the relaxation process, that's something you want to follow as best you can. Do whatever it takes to help your system soften in that fashion. For instance, for me here, if I push in hard, I can stimulate the point and I can do things like uh, work on numbness or congestion in my nose or something, but that doesn't actually release the fascia at that point. It's a different method. And so if I push into that point, I don't get that sense of that layer of my body softening. But if I soften this way, this way, then I start to get that feeling that goes all the way to my fingers. And that's why I'm trying to help people learn to listen to that layer of their body, to start it opening and becoming responsive in the same way that you would know for sure if you were feeling changes in your skin. And often if you're feeling changes in your, your joints, you'd feel like a stretch or something like that if we were pulling on it. And you'd say, oh yeah, there, that's the stretch. And it wouldn't be confusing. This isn't confusing either. It's just that we're not used to paying attention to that layer and that kind of sensation. So really do take the time to develop the awareness of this layer, both for the sake of getting chi to flow into this space, getting our mind to soak in, but also just so that we can do a better job with this practice. Get the result that we're looking for. Spending some good time again on the ring finger. Is your Johnny Cash finger. Uh, how hard do you press LA4? LA4 more in the index or the thumb? Well, it's large intestine four is just in between. If I was to squeeze my thumb toward the side of my hand, there's a bit of a muscular swelling there. And it's just in the center of that, in the center of that pad. And I'm stimulating by pressing it toward the index, but you can also stimulate it by squeezing it this way gently. Again, because we're not trying to stimulate it in the sense of doing acupressure to clear up nasal congestion. We're trying to stimulate the fascial that's at that point. And so it's different. So when I say how hard, it's as hard as we're doing the rest of the fascial release. But if you're trying to stimulate it for tooth pain or nasal congestion or something on the face, then you would squeeze it hard enough to get a, a like a slight ache or a, a chi response, something that stimulates it appropriately. But like with everything, it isn't one kind of stimulation. You have to know what you're treating and then how to get there. And for this, we are treating the fascial layer. And so how we get there is a little bit different. Gentle and soft. Getting out of the way of your breath. Similarly, as soon as you can develop the ability to sense this sinking of your chi, this settling of your body, this calming of your heart, this quieting of your mind, what happens when your chi goes in the same way that you can probably tell if your shoulders are here and they start to relax down? Same quality. Maybe you notice your breath gets a little deeper. Your hips open a bit. And you want to look for that sense of, this is what it feels like when my chi sinks, as much as noticing what it feels like when your chi is rushing up into your head. And then do whatever it requires to allow the energy to settle and get better at it. I want to, as soon as possible, set you free from any dogma or doing it the way that I'm doing it just because that's how I'm doing it kind of thing. Instead, I want you to learn how your body works and then make it work for you. Ah, I have some black tea today. 
Mm. Earl Grey. Are there any other questions? Seems a good day for questions. Very nice. I can't stick around too long afterward to answer questions, so I'll try to fit some of the re responses in during class as we're having a um, music practice after this, performing some Taoist music. Uh, well, the part of the reason for placing both hands on top of each other, I assume you mean during closing, is for lining up those pericardium eight points in the center of the palms, the laocon points. We place one over the other and then direct that through the navel toward the middle dantian. So it's a practice that guides she to the middle dantian. And there's a lot of ways that different systems do closing. Um, so you can certainly find different methods that may work for you better. If you just feel like experimenting, this, that's fine. As long as you have a sense of what sinking the chi feels like, then again, you don't have to be limited by just this one method that I'm teaching. Because there's so many, even just within our own system that I practice here, there's several different kinds of closing. And so if you find one that just helps you feel like everything is sinking and settling, and releasing, not pushing, remember, not pushing the chi down, you're letting it sink, then feel free to use that. That's perfectly OK. And that's the case with all of our practices. There's lots of variations in qigong, thousands of variations, because people find something that works for them. Sometimes the variation is there just because of dogma or because people are silly or they don't understand what they're doing. Or those things are true, too, or just outright lies. <laughs> I finished, I didn't tell you, Chris, but I finished listening to that big long interview from that supposed master. And I continue taking notes because there's two separate of the interviews that I found among some other ones. And there are so many outright lies and fabrications and just impossibilities and him claiming to be in two places at once, depending on which interview, you know, it's like he's telling the stories of three or four different people and they don't all match. It's just a mess. I do not know how people believe this person. I don't include their name here, but you know who I'm talking about. And this person is one of the people who's creating their own system. And it's clearly lies. And when they get called out on their lies, saying, hey, he is a legend, it's really sad. People say, um, but I looked in this, this entire monastery, these people you claim to study with don't exist. And he says, well, it was because it was a secret group. They were a secret. They were only for certain people. They were hiding from the, the communists, and they had the real stuff. And so people were out to get them. That's why nobody knew about them, except him, apparently. And it's the stories get weirder and more elaborate as he gets trapped in a corner, and people are like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so on and on and on. And so that person is yet another super famous person who has entire systems being created. And the variations created by him are just probably made up off the top of his head because he thinks it looks cool or because this person is not very healthy and can't touch their own toes and so, you know, or can't turn their own waist. And so it creates a variation <laughs> that they can do that looks cool or something. And so you do have to know what's happening inside yourself. Because even if you borrowed one of those kind of silly variations, but it really helped you sink your chi, that would be just fine. I literally got in a message this morning on WhatsApp 
from a friend uh, in Europe who travels around quite a lot, might be in Morocco now for all I know. And he asked uh, about st- this morning about studying with this person. And I was like, don't do it. <laughs> I know that it's tempting and he's very sparkly and all these things, but it's, it's just not good stuff. So we'll see if he listens to me or not. Circling around the waist, keeping your shoulders soft. So this is one of those things that most people can notice right away. As you're doing this movement, are your shoulders getting really tight? Are you breaking your posture? Is this exhausting in some way? Then find a different angle. Use a different part of your hand, perhaps. Uh, Sit in a different kind of chair. Maybe that helps. But by paying attention to posture and relaxation, Instantly, you can say, actually, this variation works better for me. And then you do that, as long as you're getting the softening and opening of this lumbar aponeurosis, this big fascial sheet in the back here. And endlessly, I will remind you to follow your own cues and create your own version, as long as it's not breaking certain rules like sending chi up to your head or adding more tension or holding your breath or something. So it's similar. People will ask me questions about, you know, I do this practice and it makes my mind go really wild. And I start having hallucinations. And does that mean that I'm becoming enlightened? I had somebody ask me that. No, that's not what that means. <laughs> enlightenment is the opposite of that. It's being very clear and grounded and steady. And it's the opposite of hallucinations and delusions and things. It's being completely unimpaired, seeing what's actually in front of you. And all of these qualities that we have, if something that you're doing is making you clearer, then do that thing as a practice. Follow that path. If it's making you steady and soft and grounded, that's a good practice for you. If it's taking you the other direction, even if it sounds spiritual or it's some ancient path, either change what you're doing or stop it completely. Because you want to become more and more stable and steady, clear, open-hearted, quiet. The first thing we do is we become uh, enlightenment in the, the Taoist tradition is not enlightened. You're not adding enlightenment. Enlightenment in the Taoist tradition is becoming a real person, a Jenren. You just become fully yourself, fully embodied, relaxed, open, soft, capable, these kinds of calls. I have to move around my computer here. And if you notice that it's taking you in that direction, it's a good practice. If you notice that it's disturbing you, disturbing your sleep, if it's making things too fantastical, it's supercharging your emotions, it's creating these kinds of problems, then stop because it's not good for you. It doesn't matter what it is. And just like with feeling the softness in your shoulders or Is what you're doing making your hands softer? Or is the kind of circle you're making softening this area of your tissue? Listen to that. If it's working, it's working. If it's not, change it or stop it. And that's all. In a way, it's not very complicated. The difficult part is getting people to listen. Yeah, today for me, this this spot here on the points feels so nice. I feel it warming all the way down to my toes. So 
Very good. Stomach thirty six. Gentle opening. Ooh, it even feels good on stomach thirty six. I don't know why, but I'm gonna listen to it. <laughs> this isn't how I was taught, but I can tell that it's good for me today. Call butter thirty four. And then fingers softening beneath your legs. I guess the theme of today, other than, of course, quick reminder, a channel goes to your ring finger. <laughs> just spaced repetition, just trying to spur it in your memory a bit. But the theme of today is this learning to listen, learning to see things clearly, not caught in strange ideas or following strange feelings, but becoming more and more yourself, more and more settled. Uh, it was really fascinating following this guy and looking him up in various interviews, this so-called master. And for a long time, he was, he was talking about how he was the only Westerner who was inducted into this secret sect. And, you know, this is after he'd been caught. Well, it's really a secret. That's why we don't know about it. Oh, okay. It's secret. That's why. Okay. And then he starts telling stories about how he and a friend were there. And everyone's like, oh, we thought that you were the only Western. He said, well, I ended up being the only Western because this guy looked at somebody wrong and his head exploded. This is literally a story he's telling. I'm like, what? And that's why he doesn't talk about this guy anymore. It was too traumatic. So, so he really ends up being the only Western because he's trying to make his stories fit. And I, I read in the comment section, people say, oh, what an amazing story. How amazing that he lived this life. It's like, how are people believing this stuff? <laughs> and people, I guess, something about us, we're just willing to believe anything. I mean, I see it in politics. I see it all over the place. And it's this quality, again, of just pausing, and becoming clear and going, does that seem true? And just the willingness to pause and ask that question. And when you're doing this practice, pausing and feeling your own body and saying, does this feel like the right direction? That's all, just listening. If you're starting to build up a chi charge, like it's creating really strong sensations elsewhere in your body, or if it's stirring up strong emotions or something, then just stop, take a break, do something else, come back to it, settle, really listen. Listen to yourself, listen to your others. If you happen to have a relationship, God's sake, listen to them. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> saying to yourself, which channel goes to your thumb, which channel goes to your index finger, which channel goes to your middle finger, which channel finds its way to your ring finger. Just being the school teacher. 
If you answer them all, then I give you a gold star. That spleen six point. Find that spot on your leg. Soothing and warming. Nice job, Mr. Chris. Wasn't quite right, but very close. You get a, a gold star for effort. Gold star for being the teacher's pet. <laughs> I will let you figure out which one you got wrong. because That's a good way to learn. One of them is not correct. <laughs> we'll do the small intestine in a couple of days. <sighs> Steph for the wind. I'm a really big fan of getting stuff wrong. Our whole culture of school, at least here in the States, I can't speak for other places, of course, is just, it's entirely based on reciting answers. There's like one right way to answer things. And it's, it's a very strange way to learn. Instead, we create connections. We understand how things work together. We get the why of something. We slowly piece things together and it's, they go, what? What about this? And how does this work? And what? And those kinds of questions, those are the sweet spots. That's when people are actually learning. So the gold star is just for being willing to listen. Ha, look at that. Listening to yourself, asking the right questions. It's a learning system that I was studying, and they call it the sacred question. When you don't know something and you're curious, that's when you make thousands of connections, probably hundreds of thousands of connections. And that's how we learn things. If you just get an answer, it closes the question in the curiosity period, and now you no longer know anything. You're not going to connect to anything. So it's really wonderful to not know and just be curious and to listen. That's good. Hmm. Otro. Full circles. Both directions. Part of what I'm trying to prove and to make a point about with my, my little art project on the Guccine is that you can learn very specific things 
without trying to learn specific things. All you cultivate is a state, a state of interest and openness. And then the stuff that you learn happens on its own. Your job is just to remain in that open space. And then you develop skills and things happen. And it's the same with learning things like points. You just cultivate a state of openness. And then the brain learns stuff on its own. It's fun. It's much nicer. <laughs> Circling down the outside, up the inside. Only as far as it feels comfortable. And I apologize, I have to wrap things up just a little bit early so I can go play music. The crowd is arriving, I can hear them out there, but... Spend a few moments in comfortable seated posture, or if you'd like to lie down, you're certainly welcome to. Uh, feeling your whole body buzz with life, open, warm. Thank you, everybody. Any other last moment questions? Dale had asked the question, I assume he'll watch this later, about sleep and dreams. And basically, people doing Qigong can dream more often if they are starting to sleep more deeply. And so before they were in too superficial a state of sleep to really dream well. And so if they're resting more deeply and therefore their dreams are more vivid, that's fine. However, there is a kind of vivid dream that starts to disturb your sleep and you become less rested. And it's because of, again, chi rushing upward, disturbing the heart, disturbing the mind. And if it's that kind of disturbance for anybody, not just Dell asking a question, then we want to make sure that we spend more time grounding, less time doing any gathering qigong, uh, take things much more slowly. And I, I keep telling everyone how often I hear about people damaging themselves with practice. Yesterday there were, I guess it was yesterday, there was at least one person, possibly two. I think it was the day before, maybe I had two people talk about damage they were receiving from going too fast with their practice. And it is so common. If you are starting to get chi rushing upward and you're not able to ground it, spend more time becoming still, more time doing practices like this, becoming soft, more time resting, being well nourished, allowing your body to gather and collect chi. If you gather more chi than you are able to circulate, then it rushes upward. And so more chi is not better. <laughs> more settled, grounded, well circulated chi is better. And so if your sleep is being disturbed by wild dreams, that's a bad sign and you do a different practices or you adjust in some way because again we want to learn to listen to ourselves and recognize oh this is not quite going the right direction how do i adjust i'm happy to help with that but if sleep and dreams are getting better because you're descending more deeply into the rest zone so before you were too superficial for good solid dreams and then you start to sink deeper and so dreams become more vivid that's wonderful and that's where i had that experience as well 
And so you have to self-diagnose a little bit since I can't be there and take your pulse and see what's going on. But please be careful. <laughs> please pay attention again to what it feels like to be settled and clear and soft and gentle and kind to yourself and the world around you and not frantic or manic or tense. Go one way, not the other. <laughs>